Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Maddie Quirk from Ausveg, and today's webinar is on American Serpentine Leaf Miner. Are you prepared? This webinar forms part of the Hort Innovation Funded Annual Vegetable Industry Seminar, which is led by Ausveg. This is the third of a series of webinars following on from the Annual Vegetable Industry Seminar at Hort Connections 2021. We had over 160 people register for today's session, which is a fantastic turnout. So thanks so much for expressing interest and for coming along. It's going to be a great session today. And we have some incredibly knowledgeable speakers online to discuss the American Serpentine Leaf Miner. But before I begin, in the spirit of reconciliation, Ausveg would like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and the connections to land, sea and community. I'm coming to you from Wurundjeri country today. However, wherever you are joining us from, may we take a moment to acknowledge country from which we produce our food and its people who have looked after and survived on this land for thousands of years. We pay respect to their elders past, present and emerging and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people here today. So just some housekeeping before we jump into the session. Today's session will run for one hour and 15 minutes with four speakers and then plenty of time for Q&A. We'll be recording the session and it will be available on the Ausveg website following the event. Please ask questions by typing into the Q&A function. The chat has been disabled for this webinar. And finally, we'll endeavour to respond to all questions today. However, if we can't um, respond to your question, we'll respond in the post-event email. Within that email, there'll also be a survey to complete. So please fill that in as it will assist Ausveg in tailoring future AVIS events. So as we know, American Serpentine Leaf Miner or ASLM is a harmful new pest that has just arrived in Australia, being detected in the Northern Territory, Queensland and Western Australia. ASLM poses a serious threat to Australia's horticulture, nursery production and agricultural plant industries. We're very fortunate to have a range of ASLM experts both here in Australia and overseas and today these experts will be sharing their experience and insights on ASLM and what the future of management for this pest may look like. So today we'll be hearing from Dr Greg Chandler, Hort Innovation R&D Manager for Biosecurity, Robert Sen, Syngenta Global Technical Manager for Insecticides, who is actually dialing in from Switzerland today. Dr. Peter Ridland, the University of Melbourne Honorary Research Fellow, and Penny Goldsmith, Senior Agronomist at River District Cooperative, who is joining us from Kununurra near one of the detection sites. But before our speakers present, I'll be quickly setting the scene and providing a brief situation update. So the American Serpentine Leaf Miner was first detected from samples taken by the Northern Australia Quarantine Strategy Officers in the Torres Strait in far north Queensland, as well as northern WA. The WA samples were collected in March 2021 in Kununurra, and in May 2021, the NARCS officers collected larval specimens um, of suspect leaf miner on Thursday Island in the Torres Strait. In July and August 2021, further detections occurred near Bamaga in Queensland, in Broome, Western Australia, and in Darwin and Catherine, Northern Territory. The Consultative Committee on Emergency Plant Pests has met in response to these detections and the members agreed that American Serpentine Leaf Miner is considered an emergency plant pest under the Emergency Plant Pest Deed. Following additional surveys, it was also agreed that American Serpentine Leaf Miner is not technically feasible to eradicate from Australia. However, the committee also highlighted the need for government and industry to work closely together focusing on how growers can manage the pest and actions that will help contain it to its current distribution. And finally, there are no current interstate trade restrictions for this pest. However, the WA state government is reviewing their restrictions currently. I'd now like to invite Dr. Greg Chandler, Hort Innovation R&D Manager for Biosecurity. So Greg, if you can please organise the sharing of your screen, that would be great. And for everyone listening today, Greg will be speaking on how investing levy funding into two projects on exotic leaf miners has prepared the Australian vegetable industry for the arrival of these pests. Thanks, Greg. Thanks, Maddie. Uh, okay. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm here to set the scene from a, a value of preparedness uh, perspective, if you like, for American serpentine leaf miner 
based on some of the work that we did under some previous projects uh, due to some um, lovely foresight in the vegetable industries. All right. So if we go back to 2017, uh, around about a little bit after vegetable leaf miner was first discovered up on the, the far northern peninsula there of Cape York, um, we got a research project up and running on vegetable leaf miner, management of vegetable leaf miner, and some diagnostics and detection around how do we find this thing. The project was set up to examine all of this because this is the first of these exotic leaf miners that was to arrive in Australia. Uh, they're number 20 on our high priority plant pests. There's a series of five of them. Unfortunately, we now have three of those five. The project was set up to determine how we can survey for this thing. How do we find it? When we do find a leaf miner, we have lots of those in the country already, native and otherwise endemic. So how do we distinguish this one in a rapid sort of sense? How can we tell what this is, especially in those larval forms? A major component here was putting together some host lists. And it's not just scaring the literature and coming up with your host list, because you can find a host list somewhere that says this thing can exist on 350 different things. But is it really a pest on those things? Or did someone just happen to once glance over and saw it sitting on a leaf and decided that that was a host. So what is the confidence that that host list is actually accurate? So something that this project really did very well was go through and prioritize from you know, high confidence down to low, whether some, a particular plant was a good host for this pest. So there are a lot of the things that we did, predictive modeling around where the thing might turn up, Contingency plans when it arrives, or in this case, if it were to leave far north Queensland and get into production areas, how would those production areas then deal with it? Different management options, including biological and chemical controls, and then a lot of education and extension. I've only got that there in a smallish box, but there was an awful lot of work that went into the extension behind this, getting the word out to growers, getting it out to different communities on what to look for and, and, and whatnot. And there's a lot of great uh, information there on the OSWEDS, OSVEG webpage in particular. Now, in 2020, we were able to vary that project a little bit to include serpentine leaf miner and American serpentine leaf miner in terms of the diagnostics, the host lists, and some of the contingency plannings and risk forecasting areas. This was uh, in recognition of the risk posed by these particular uh, insects as well as the close proximity they were getting in parts of Asia. Uh, I remember when I was in East Timor doing some border work, trying to increase their border capacity for biosecurity, cut flowers from Indonesia would arrive on just about every Indonesian flight. We would show them how to inspect. And we found American serpentine leaf miner in just about every box of chrysanthemums that came through. So the, the risk was clear and present. We also knew that serpentine leaf miner was around. So, we were able to get a lot of this basic information, which is often lacking during an incursion, and have it ready to roll and, and use if and when these things were arriving. So let's fast forward to maybe this time last year, it was really October. October 2020 is when serpentine leaf miner was discovered in Sydney. So all of a sudden we could pull out all of these plans. So New South Wales DPI were the lead agency in this particular case. Uh, the project hadn't finalized all of these documents yet, but they were very close. And they happily provided those documents to New South Wales DPI to enable them to get on with, with surveying for this pest and identifications. So one of the surveillance uh, tools that was developed in the vegetable leaf miner project uh, was a mock surveillance protocol. So how do you look for this thing? And what confidence do you get if you spend X amount of time looking at each plant in a field that you would have picked it up if it was present? So the field surveillance officers had immediately had something to go on. We had the contingency plans, and most importantly, we had accurate confidence in the host lists. So we can immediately narrow down the searches to just those really important hosts in that initial phase. So we immediately had val extra value out of that previous project. Because of all of that, and I was able to, to join that first CCEPP meeting as a guest, I immediately called a meeting exactly during that, that meeting 
uh, of all of the industry reps. And we got together pretty much straight after, along with New South Wales DPI, and formulated what we might need to do in, in, to, in order to respond to serpentine leaf miner and help industry. So within four months, which is reasonably good time for an RDC and all of our internal workings, we were able to get a fully fledged project up and running, being led by Queensland DAF at the moment, looking at serpentine leaf miner, the beneficials that are already affecting that, and how we can integrate that into our pest management, as well as a big extension component on getting out the word out to growers, what it is, the importance of it, how to look for it, and so on. So we were immediately getting more value out of that previous project because the basic information was already there. We were now able to do some ground truthing and, and get on with the extra components that might have otherwise taken two or three years to get there. So we've, we've made rapid progress on that already. Right now, because we have an existing project, we're pivoting to do a variation to this one to include American Serpentine Leaf Miner. Doing that brings in lots of efficiencies. So it doesn't cost as much. And the project team is already thinking in that space. So they're off and running. And now we can bring in the Northern Territory and Western Australian groups and work on what, what are the beneficial insects up there that are really getting into it already? How do we manage this pest? And more importantly for this one, how do we contain it to those areas where it is now and not to let it spread or at least slow that spread? So just before I hand over to the, to the expert team, this uh, map was produced in the first project and it's the American Serpentine Leaf Miner, essentially a risk profile as to where it would likely be quite happy within Australia. You can see some parts of Northern Australia are reasonably positive in where it can exist. But if you look at the, the East Coast and the Southwest, it looks like it would be really happy almost all year based on a lot of those climatic and environmental conditions. This also gives us something that we can take, to, take out to those research teams and say, look, we've already got this. Here are the priority areas to be looking for it, particularly in, in risk areas that are adjacent to known locations already and gives us a great platform to launch already. So the value of preparedness here has saved us two to three years already in terms of getting into the research and management of this particular nasty beast. So with that, Maddie, I will stop sharing my screen and we can carry on. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Greg. Well, it is really pleasing to see that the Australian vegetable industry has been preparing for these pests since 2017. Um, personally, I know that Ausveg has really enjoyed playing a role in strengthening our industry's capacity to respond. So thanks for that. And now we're going to hear from um, Robert Sen, Syngenta Global Technical Manager for Insecticides. So Robert, oh, you've already got your screen up. Um, that's great. And I'll introduce you. So. Robert will be speaking on the European experience of American serpentine leaf miner and chemical control agents to support the management of exotic leaf miners, including American serpentine leaf miner. Thank you, Robert. Thank you, Matty, and thank you for the, the opportunity to speak to you. My presentation is mainly based on our experience in Europe and the US, and I will uh, talk about the biology and the the control experience we had in the last years. First, normally when we have a new pest, we look at the copy page. This uh, you can see here. In this case, the copy page is not very much up to date. What they say, it's an important pest in the, in the US and also in Mediterranean Europe and in South America. So Australia is not yet on. It's also probably because it's difficult to differentiate these leaf miners. Therefore, this information is not very precise. Let's now look at the uh, at, uh, American serpentine leaf miner. You see it on the arrow. What we guess is that it's the origin is in the US, probably the southern states like Florida, Louisiana. From there, it went for sure to, the, to South America and to uh, probably East Africa, to the ornamental area and to Europe, from East Africa, probably to Europe as well. And from there to the East. And finally, this arrow is still missing. To Australia. It looks like it's following more or less the ornamental trade. The ornamentals in this case, like in other cases as well, 
were probably the driver of, of the distribution of, of this new pest. We have then also other leaf miners, I'm not sure whether they are already in Australia or not, like uh, Brione, which is a uh, origin from Europe. Then we have Huitobrensis, which was also very important during some times from South America. And then we have uh, Sativa, Leromitsa Sativa, from unknown origin. Let's now look at the host plants. Greg already mentioned there are many host plants for the Lyramitsa trifoli. It's first, it's of course the ornamentals like carnation. It likes very much the chrysanthemum and cherpera, but then we have also many agriculture important pests like the, the Genopodiaceae. We have the cabbages, the, the cucurbits, all of them, even in onion. Important, it is also in cotton. And uh, the beans and peas are one of the preferred hosts. And then, of course, also the Solanaceae. All the Solanaceae, like potatoes over eggplants to tomatoes. You see on the right side, tomato, and then the heavily damaged beans in a greenhouse in Europe. Looking at the biology of Liromitsa, we, we of course we start with eggs. The eggs are lasting just for a few days. They are very small, they are uh, translucent, they are normally difficult to see. Then we get the larvae, they are typical dipteran shape maggots. They are first pale, get then a uh, darker yellow orange, what you see on, on this, this photo. They are feeding in the mesophyll, so inside the leaf. They are not uh, penetrating the surface. They last not that long, only a few days, up to seven days. And the pupation is for Liriomyza trifolia in the soil. For others like Hydrobrensis, it's also on the leaf. But trifolia is in the soil. The pupa is, is quite big, easy to see if you find it. Uh, it's first pale and then dark. You see here on the photo, it's an older larva. They last about seven to 14 days. So altogether, the cycle is about 15 to 25 days, depending on the temperature. Now the adults, this is actually the, the easiest stage to differentiate uh, trifoli from other uh, leaf miners, you see on the left side, the uh, trifoli, it is grayish black. Okay? It's not, uh, not completely black, it has this grayish appearance. The scutellum here on the back is bright yellow. So this is very typical for trifoli. The other leaf miners, they are completely black and the scutellum has a smaller yellow dot. But for identification, we need a specialist. It's not, uh, it's not easy like uh, for some of the Lepidoptera. So you have to approach a specialist. The mines is also a point to see the differences. The, the Trifoli is a serpentine mine and normally it doesn't cross the main veins. What you see on this uh, uh, tomato leaf, this is a typical shape. The mining is in the upper part of the mesophyll. Therefore, we have this paper-like whitish appearance of the mine. The other uh, leaf miners like Hoidobrensis, normally they cross the veins. You see it here on these leaves. The larvae are mining also in the lower parenchyme, and therefore we have a different, uh, more darker appearance and not the shiny whitish appearance of the, of the mines. The damage we have uh, first, these punctures. These are feeding punctures, which are uh, about uh, uh, a tenth of a millimeter, but quite easy to see. And it's a serious damage in ornamentals. So it can, uh, it can uh, be not acceptable in chrysanthemum, for example. Then of course, we have a reduction of the assimilation because of the mines. So the assimilation surface is reduced 
and the loss of aesthetic quality in flowers. And the last but not least is the export limitation because of quarantine and uh, in some counties also it's a quarantine pest, so there is a zero tolerance. Now let's go to the control to the, of this pest. The, actually, the, the backbone of the control in Europe is the biological control of Liromitsa. This is mainly in, in the greenhouse, this is a, is a very common practice. So we have uh, two or actually three of these uh, parasitic wasps available. We have first the uh, naturally occurring Diglyphus isea on the right side, and then the uh, Dagnusa siberica on the left side. Both of them are uh, commercially available. You see these packages from Coppert. This is coming in a, in a granule you can distribute on the plant. It's very easy to do. Normally, they, they bring this in in, a, in the early season of a crop. The diglyphos is normally available, but often it's coming too late. Therefore, it's also uh, uh, needed to release it uh, and to buy it and to release it artificially. Insecticides are anyhow uh, used and combined with beneficials. There is, of course, some, some uh, measures to be uh, followed, like to avoid broad spectrum insecticides like pyrethroids, then also avoid to spray during the hot hours and to focus the insecticides in early season when the beneficials not yet are there or not yet are there to a sufficient level. What we also should look is at the residuality. If possible, use short residual compounds and not compounds which last for a very long time, mainly when we want to introduce afterwards. So these are the points we have to follow in order to be uh, uh, compatible and to, to, to save the beneficial. Looking at the insecticides, we have to start very early in the young plants when we see the first symptoms, mainly these feeding symptoms. What normally they use in Europe is a soil application when they get the plants from the nursery. So there are uh, products available which are systemic and can be used into the uh, nursery tray or, uh, or any systemic application. For post planting, there is also still in Europe, we have a quite a series of insecticides available. Probably this may change soon, but uh, at the moment it's still fine. They use this with intervals of seven to 14 days, depending on the, on the tolerance of the crop. In some crops, of course, it can, it's much shorter in ornamental than in other crops. What is always, a, and mainly in this case, a, a warning point is the resistance. We have actually resistance reported to almost all the insecticides. And there is, a, from my colleague, is a lot of work done in the US. We have resistance levels between 20 and 1,000. So that means, in the worst case, the, the products are not working at all anymore. Fortunately, the resistance, what we have seen, is not stable. So there is a negative fitness impact linked to this resistance. Therefore, we have a reversion after five to nine generations. So in this case, actually, we are quite lucky. In other cases, we don't see that. Uh, with some of the compounds, they are less robust than the others, but uh, they are all actually not stable resistance, fortunately. What this means is, if you have, uh, if you are facing this pest, we have to follow the, the IDAC recommendation. This is this uh, insecticide resistance action committee recommendation. That means we have to implement IPM. We have to use beneficials and we have to apply the insecticides in a window application. So on this graph, for example, what we could do is to start with a soil application with the first mode of action, 
for example, at Diamede, and then we go on with the second window. A window is normally a generation, so in this case, it will be 25 days. We have then two to three foliar application with a different mode of action. And this depends on the threshold and on the, on the pressure we, we have or we accept. And we get then another mode of action window after this 25 days. And this will increase depending on the increase of the beneficials. So in the best case now in Spain, for example, we have a, a, a two free applications here and then the beneficials, they will increase uh, beside. So that is the ideal case, but uh, I'm not sure whether you have already resistance with these uh, flies you got to Australia, but most probably you will face this problem very soon. Now let's look at the situation in, in uh, Europe. I ask our, uh, our uh, own organization in Spain and also the extension service in Spain about the situation they have with Liriomyza trifoli, as it was introduced in actually already quite some years ago, first in Holland in 76 uh, in ornamentals, and then in Spain, uh, 95 to 98. What they say is they have still many uh, uh, insecticides available and the biological control is working well. So they also don't see much of a difference between uh, Liriomyza trifoli to other leaf miners. Today, it's actually, they say it's a minor concern. So it's mainly a problem in ornamentals, in mushrooms and uh, in beans. They mentioned this specifically. Now, when we go to the extension service in Spain, they say it's still a problem but only in certain situations. That is in tomato, for example, in young plantations, when you get infected plants from the nursery, or in all the plantation at harvest time, when the biological control is not taking up, then it can be a problem. What they recommend is to have a very strict hygiene in the, in the nursery, and to start very early with the release of the parasitoids. So thank you very much. This is uh, from my side. It was a pleasure. Thanks a lot. Well, thank you very much for that update, Robert. That was fantastic. And it's good to know that Australia can learn from the example of Europe so that we can help, it can help us to manage this pest in Australia. I personally found it particularly interesting when you mentioned IPM and ensuring we need to look after the beneficial wasps. So thank you for that. I'd now like to invite um, Dr. Peter Ridland, the University of Melbourne Honorary Research Fellow to speak. Peter will share over 20 years of experience with exotic leaf miners and how to prepare for American serpentine leaf miner, focusing on biological control across the Australian landscape. Thanks, Peter. Thanks, Maddie. It's a great, Pleasure to be able to speak today. What have I done? Knocked it up straight away. First of all, I'd like to acknowledge Elia Pertle, who was a, has been an instrumental part of the, both projects that Horde Innovation have done. And she's produced many of the, uh, the images that we have on the screen and also many of the graphics, but is also a, a very enthusiastic and competent worker for us. Now, my sort of um, history of leaf miners goes back to my work with in Indonesia where I was privileged to, oh God, I've done it again. I, I was privileged to be leading a project, an ACR project on Liriomyza huitabrensis and also Liriomyza sativi, looking at, uh, at pest management strategies for Indonesia. This was a situation where things were out of control. Farmers were spraying their potatoes three times a week. So generally it was, uh, a closer case of a pesticide treadmill. So this was a, a very important learning exercise for, for Australia. All around the world, there's been some universal themes that have been relating to invasions, incursions of Liriomyza species, including 
American Serpentine Leaf Miner. First of all, as Robert told us in his excellent presentation, the movement of infested plant material between regions and countries has been fundamental in its spread around the world. And it's, it's a spread that's really occurred since about the mid 70s. The other theme is that destruction of their paras the parasitoid wasps, the parasitic wasps which attack leaf miners by the excessive use of non-selective insecticides has been demonstrated time and again all over the world. As far back as about 1915 in the USA, they were realizing that some of the things they were spraying were causing problems to, their, to the parasitoids. And coupled with, and particularly with Trifolius, the development of insecticide resistance, which has really led to its building up its problem around the world, particularly in glass houses. But what it's done, it's actually displaced vegetable leaf miner, Liriomyza sativa, in many places, including southern USA, in China. It's basically, they have very similar biologies, but uh, because it's insecticide resistance levels are high, it, it dominates. But the important message, and Robert gave that important message, is that effective management has been developed in all, all parts of the world where, that have dealt with this problem. And I think that's um, a very positive theme that we need to keep talking about all the time, that, that it's not the end of the world when the, a leaf miner turns up. So the foundations of their IPM approaches is understanding the role of the parasitoids. Monitoring pest activity is vital. It's important that sprays are only applied when they needed to be applied. And also it enables early in the crop that parasitoid populations can build up without being decimated. And as again, as Robert said, avoiding the broad spectrum insecticides. It's the inappropriate chemicals that basically kill the wasps, but don't kill the, uh, the larvae inside the leaf. And even we've had examples in Queensland already when growers are faced with a the serpentine leaf miner and celery, there's been use of a wide range of chemicals, some of which such as synthetic pyrethroids and carbamates really will not be affecting the flies, but will be affecting, or the larvae, they'll be affecting the, the parasitoids. That leads to a whole lot of questions for Australian horticulture. We've got a lot of information from around the world, but we've got a, a very large country with a whole diverse range of environments, a diverse range of crops, so there's not a one size fits all. So we'll, we'll, in the next few years, we'll be learning a lot about the seasonal abundance of, the, of, of all these flies and their phenology, that's going to be vital. We need to know a lot more about the dispersal, both within a region, within a crop, and also between regions. The longer we can keep the American serpentine leaf miner to the north, so much the better. There's the issue of outdoor cropping versus protected cropping. And that's there's quite a dramatic difference there, I think, with uh, conditions for leaf miners pretty good inside a glass house. Uh, but certainly we can look to the outdoor crops in Florida, Texas, Arizona and California on a whole range of crops such as tomatoes, lettuce, uh, capsicums, and, and they manage the crop, they manage the pest very well in amongst a suite of other, other pests. So that's the challenge always, is to manage with that suite of pests that you have. As I mentioned, there we, the flies affect crops differently. So different, some crops will be affected more than others. And so sampling and economic thresholds need to be developed on a, on a crop by crop basis, and, and they'll vary from different parts of the country. The vital thing that I'm interested in is how the natural enemies are responding. What's the role of non-crop hosts? Sometimes people get a bit disappointed in the first few months of an incursion because suddenly a new pest comes in, the pest goes crazy, but it takes a while for the, what, the natural enemies to sort of find out that there's a whole lot of uh, new, uh, new hosts to attack. So I think we need to have some patience that we'll be building up our population of parasitoids within a region and in subsequent seasons, there'll be a lot more around that, that can help us. The issue of insecticides is an ongoing issue. As part of the Hort Innovation Project, we've got emergency use permits in place for a range of insecticides and a range of crops. These are short-lived, 
they will expire and we can't re renew them until we get Australian efficacy data. So that's a challenge for, for the industry to, and the, both the chemical industry and the horticultural industry to make sure that we do end up with registrations of those chemicals that we want. And the insecticide resistance status is really important. Uh, New South Wales DPI are doing a lot of good work there, funded partly by Horty Innovation, so that we're in good hands there. So today I really want to talk about the endemic parasitoid delirium miser species in Australia. When I say endemic, some of the parasitoids are native, but some have actually come into the country with, with other leaf miners over the years. Maybe the, we've had a few leaf miners that have come back far back as uh, sort of the turn of the 19th, about 1900. Aaliyah's taken some magnificent photos of, of these wasps. They are very small, but they are very beautiful. So hopefully you guys will get a chance at some stage of looking at them under a magnifying glass or under a, magnif a microscope and to see what magnificent creatures we're dealing with. They're very small, mostly only about a millimetre. But you can see up at the top here how, what a range of different shapes and sizes we have, different colours, often have this really beautiful green metallic colour. Remember this guy with his antenna, his branched antennae, that's what we call Hemitarsinus veracornis. All their names are longer than they are. You know, they're great long names, but very small wasps. But Hemitarsinus is what I call the first responder. Uh, we found it, we find it from tip of Cape York down to Tasmania. The very first incursion of Blyrimizer sativa was in fact parasitized by Hemitarsinus. Presumably it had come across from another ag agromizer. So already in, we're finding a lot of Hemitarsinus, certainly on Guido Brensis. They kill in two ways. They both, as well as just parasitizing the leaf miner larvae, they, they kill, kill the larvae by host feeding. So they're a double-edged uh, way of working. And the thing to remember is that they're generalists. They will attack many leaf miner species. In fact, some of them will attack leaf mining lepidopterans as well as leaf mining dipterans. So that's very general. The downside of that is that it's very hard to import biological control agents that are generalists. But the good news is, I think most of, most of them are already here. I wanted to talk briefly about how these parasitoids work. And to do that, I thought I'd revisit some of the work that, that Robert told us about the, about the life cycle. It's a pretty simple life cycle. Female lays the egg up there. There are three larval instars. And as with all insects, it's the final instar, the third instar, which is much, much bigger, does much more of the damage. And so just remember the third instar is, is by the far the biggest one. When, they, when they're ready to pupate, they'll, they cut out of the leaf, leave the plant. Remember, these are blind as well, so they just bumble along. They, they head towards the soil, and then they'll, then they'll form their puparia, and they'll pu pupate inside that. They won't always get to the ground if they, if they run into some other dark, that spot they may well just in, in high numbers they might just pupate there so we are seeing puparia on, on plants as well particularly in celery when it's in high numbers they tend to cut out from the leaf very early in the morning so it's a very dis bit discreet window that they come out so that's when they uh, they do come out and that's they've only got a limited time before they have to start forming the puparia otherwise they'll desiccate uh, and so that's possibly one of the reasons why they you'll sometimes see them on leaves where they've decided that they're getting a bit hot, they have to start to pupate. I'm afraid I love, I love numbers, but this is looking at the life cycle, temperature and development. I've just, this is from celery in the US, but 20 degrees and 25 degrees. Egg larva pupae, so totally 30 days for, for, at 20 degrees, 19 days at 25. Multiple generations in most, most crops. And that's why they become important because we get multiple generations happening within a crop. The larvae are the vulnerable stage to parasitoid wasps, but they're also the vulnerable stage to insecticides. The eggs are basically just sitting there and the pupae are often in the soil or they're certainly not taking up insecticides. And so when you look at the mean time of the stages, it's about 40% of the time they're at this susceptible stage of the larvae and 60% of the time they're really not, not accessible to, uh, to acting on. And also you need to realise that the three larval stages larval instars are about the same length in time. So, so 25 degrees, for example, in round terms, 
the third instal larvae is feeding maybe for two and a half days, two, two and a half to three days. So that's when the damage is happening. We obviously have multiple generations happening, so but it's it is a very small window when the wasps and the and the and the uh, and the the farmers got the uh, ability to, to do some damage. So the parasitoid wasps have got two different ways of, of, of operating, and I think it's important to understand that they're, they're complementary. There's no one there's no one parasitoid that's the best. There's there's a whole range of parasitoids, and and what you'd be hoping for is a whole range of parasitoids contributing. In certain situations, species A will do better than species B, and vice versa. So the most common one is what I call a paralyzed and host feeding. Scientists like to call them idiobiont. No one else likes to call them that, but I do. Uh, and examples we are the hemitarsinus, which I keep talking about. We can see Aaliyah's lovely drawing up here of one. Female's got this lovely and very convenient half. Its final segment is, is white. Makes it very easy to identify for most of us. Another one's a Zandramosoma. And basically how they work is they, as soon as they get to find the host larva, they paralyze it. And then once they paralyze it, and the, and the advantage of paralyzing is that means that their food resource is fixed for their offspring. So the, the larva doesn't grow anymore. But if you sting a really small larva, you won't have you won't, you won't have much food for their, they won't have much food for their offspring. So then they'll either host feed from the larva, which when they stung the, the larva, the body fluids come up and they'll feed on that. And they often do that on, on, on smaller larvae to do that. What the reason they have to do that is because when when these wasps uh, emerge from their pupa, they actually don't have any eggs that are fully developed. So they need to feed on, on proteins and lipids from the host larva to get their eggs to develop. And once they do lay an egg, they'll either lay it beside, beside the, the uh, leaf miner larva or they'll actually lay it inside the leaf, leaf miner larva and basically start to consume, consume it. But this is a paralyzed larva that's just sitting there. And so then the wasp will pupate inside the mine and emerge from the leaf. The second state type is one that I call a no paralysis, no host feeding. And that's a coin of bio. And that's the opiate species I've talked about are similar to that. They don't paralyze their host at all, but they'll oviposit into any, any larval stage. In fact, some of them will actually oviposit into an egg. So the fly larva is largely unconcerned by that and keeps feeding. And so there'll still be damage in that generation. And it's only when the fly pupates that the, uh, the parasite begins to develop inside the fly and then it pupates inside the fly and it eventually emerges from the puparium. So whenever you see a lot, something called a larval pupal parasitoid, that's the one that's a larval pupal parasitoid. It's, it's, it's the wasp has attacked the larva, but the wasp emerges from the pupae. You know that is a, a coin of bion. So it's doing all this development in the, in the pupa. So these, these wasps don't have any impact on the immediate generation, but the second generation in the crop is greatly diminished because you've got a lot of wasps and not many, not many flies coming through. As I'm just repeating it again, we've, we've done an extensive survey in, of the literature. We've done a fair bit of sample evening in Victoria. And there's been work done in South Australia, ACT and Queensland. But this is largely pre the nasty Lyrimizers coming in, but we found a large, there are a large number of species of wasps that are known to attack Lyrimizer species elsewhere in the world. And there's likely to be a lot more because we've been dealing in a situation where we've had low numbers of agromizer larvae to sample, but suddenly with a situation such as we have in the Ord River, such as we have the Southeast Queensland, such as we have in Western Sydney, suddenly there's a vast number of larvae, of leaf miner larvae about, and suddenly the a whole range of these parasitoids will, will actually become noticeable in sampling because of the, the scale that we've got there. So key ones we've found are Hemitarsinus, Diglyphus isaia. Diglyphus is the one that Robert mentioned, that's, the, that's mass reared in Europe and in USA and Japan. Opia species are important. They are uh, the conids that these have got three Australian species. The Neochrysocris formosa is another important spe species in Asia. Uh, We've been doing a lot of work on it at the University of Melbourne. And uh, it's an interesting one because it's actually a, the strain we have in Australia is a, is a female only line. So that's 
potentially useful for mass rearing. But as part of the new project, with John Duff's been sampling in Southeast Queensland, and already we've seen some fascinating things. Hemitarsinus ferricornis is the most abundant. You can probably just see here, John sent me this photo yesterday. It's uh, just here, there's a, a, a wasp, wasp larva. He's dug out the, the paralyzed larvae from the, the leaf mine. So you can see it's still pretty small, so it's gonna have a, a fair bit to eat there. But what we have found, we had we found Neocrostochrus okasaki, which is um, important parasitoid in, of leaf miners in Japan. It's important parasit in Taiwan, Vietnam, and widespread in the lowlands areas of Indonesia. We'd only ever found one specimen in Australia before. That was found in Southern Victoria back in the early 2000s as part of the ACR project. So that was confirmed by John LaSalle. But suddenly here we are, have as relatively large numbers of a, of a species we really didn't know was widespread in Australia. And this was sort of early days in the sampling. So I think if we're finding it rapidly already, it's likely to be widespread. John also found Neocrosochrus formosa there. So that was, that's really encouraging. Plenty of opiates, but opiates were, these three species were described in Queensland. So it's no great surprise. But one of the things we did really enjoy seeing was the Gronotoma, which is a eucoiline. This one over here, we've got very distinctive venation in the wing. It's got very shiny gaster. It's got this large projection on its thorax here. So very distinctive, but we've never, we've never had one reared from an agromizer in Australia before, but certainly in Indonesia, in Hawaii, in other parts of the world, in Japan, it's, it can be a very important uh, parasitoid. In fact, in Hawaii, they've, they have developed mass rearing for the gronotoma. Gronotoma, as I said, is a kind of biont, so that's one that emerges out of the pupae. So I'll keep beating the drum. We have abundant reservoirs of parasitoids in Australia. And we've got a numerous species of, the, of these non-pest leaf miner flies, which have been supporting these reserves, if you like. We'll have in sow thistle, plantain, brassicaceous weeds, and volunteer grasses. Nearly all of these, of course, are in, aren't in native plants. They're, they're plants that are effectively weeds to Australia, but they've come with their uh, Right, with both leaf miners and with uh, parasitoids. We clearly need more research because who knows what we'll discover, but uh, it's all really promising. But what we do know is that we've got plenty of promising biocontrol options. There's no need for imports. We already have suitable species for, for mass rearing if needed. And who knows, some of the other Australian species may also be useful for mass rearing as we learn more about them. So. Protect what we have, let the parasitoids do their thing. I'd just like to acknowledge the two projects that have been involved in the last two years, the first project and the second project. And with that, I'll finish. Thank you. That's Wonderful. My Thanks, Peter. That was a really insightful presentation. Really appreciate that. It's great news to see that there are so many parasitoid wasps that are potentially capable of attacking leaf miners in Australia as well. So I'd now like to invite Penny Goldsmith, Senior Agronomist at River District Cooperative, to speak about the recent detections and impact that American serpentine leaf miner is having on industry in Kununurra. So thank you, Penny. Good afternoon. Um, so my job here is just to give a bit of an update on uh, what we've been seeing in the ord, um, in the field so far this season with the leaf miner. Um, so I've just got a few slides to run through um, just with some pictures on some of the different crops we've been seeing damage in. Um, and obviously, I think as Peter was speaking about, there are definitely differences in the, um, in the different crops, the way they've been affected. So first up, we've got a... Um, some of the damage that we're seeing in the cucurbits and you can see the nice little leaf trails or trails in the leaf that the miner has been making. Um, this is some um, uh, further damage. So we've had a, generally our cucurbit crops haven't been very um, badly affected. And this is probably due to incidental control of the leaf miner by using um, systemic chemistry to control other pests. So um, 
using the group 28s to control grubs in the cucurbits will be helping to um, keep the leaf miner numbers down. Uh, this is a crop where um, they hadn't been using many group 28s and they've been using more broad spectrum controls. Um, so you can see the older damage and how it looks a little bit diseasey as well, um, but that's definitely leaf miner damage. And on the photo on the right hand side of the screen, you can see one of the little pupae um, that's come out of the leaf mine there as well. Um, and this is in some of our bean crops. So this is mainly dried beans, but we've also been seeing them in the green beans as well. And that's uh, the dried beans has been everything from bolotti beans through to cow peas and even in soybean. Um, and again, you've got the pupae that are, you know, obviously there's a lot of them there. So they're sort of just getting stuck to the leaf and getting on with the job of pupating. Um, we're even seeing damage in sunflowers. So again, you can see the older damage looks a lot like disease and the brown spots on the leaves and things, but definitely you can see the trails in those leaves as well. Um, and they're right through to, um, on the left hand side there, you can see that's an okra leaf. And on the right, there's a red chard with a nice little leaf trail in there. Uh, so one of our worst affected crops was actually in head lettuce. So this uh, particular crop on the left-hand side, so the damage started in the older leaves and it, because it looked a lot like disease rather than an insect pest, um, the, there was no sort of control or the control that was done obviously was targeting more of a disease. And so there was almost a total wipeout. Um, and even before the, the head lettuce actually died from the damage, the, they were unharvestable anyway. Um, and everything right through to our cut flowers are getting attacked as well. So I've just got a few little um, leaf specimens as well that I'll um, be able to show you when I can stop sharing. There we go. Stop sharing the screen. Um, so, yeah, probably the main one is the, the lettuce leaf. So you can, it's a bit blurry. There we go. Um, so you can see that it really just looks a lot more like disease symptoms than anything else. But there's sorry, Penny. Oh, sorry, we might sorry. just. Would it be okay to remove that um, background that you have on at the moment so we can okay. see that clearly? Sure. If I can figure out how to. Okay. All right. Let's try that. Okay, is that probably a bit better? That's great, thank you. Yeah. So then, yeah, you can just see that really on that lettuce leaf, all the sort of browning on there um, really looks like disease, but it's, yeah, definitely been affected by leaf miner. And um, some other quick ones is um, they're even getting stuck into some of our weed species. So this is a milk thistle leaf. So again, the, the browning and you can see the leaf trails in there as well. Um, yeah, so probably some of the points I'd like to make as well is just, yeah, the differences in the crops. Um, yeah, we're getting so mass damage on lettuce where it's been uncontrolled. Um, and then you've got the other end of the spectrum where there might be some populations trickling along in our dried bean um, crops uh, and we're spraying for other pests. So but the trouble with that is that the main um, chemicals registered on our dried bean crops are actually the group ones and the broad spectrum chemistry that are gonna be taking out the beneficials that we've been speaking about. So we just need to, I suppose, do a bit more work on how, how the IPM strategy works across a broad range of crops um, and not necessarily just in those ones where this leaf mine is gonna do the worst damage because if it trickles along in other crops, and then we're spraying broad spectrum chemistry, we're building resistance in that population that then crosses over to the next crop and those sorts of things. Um, yeah, and I think that that's probably the main thing. The only other thing um, that I could mention is, yeah, just that um, the incidental control with the group 28s has been quite good so far in a lot of our crops where we've been using them, but, Again, the reliance on a single 
mode of action to control a pest is never a good thing in terms of resistance. Uh, and that's probably all I can um, add to this conversation. Thanks so much, Penny. No, that, look, that was really fantastic. Having first-hand experience um, dealing with the pest is really valuable for webinars like these. So thank you so much. Um, we have had quite a few questions come through to our Q&A um, box. So I might invite the speakers to please um, share their videos um, again and um, unmute yourself where possible. Um, so we do have about 15, 20 minutes to go through some of these questions. Um, and if we do run out of time, we can send some in the follow-up email. Um, so we've just received a comment first off. Um, we detected leaf, mi leaf miner flies since 2013 in Pierce Dale, Victoria. May not be the same as ASLM, but um, for this particular person, it's similar to Liriomyce weedabrensis in the look of it. Um, this person's Peruvian and, and well familiar with this pest. Um, any comments, please? So I might pair that with um, another question that's coming through as well. Um, actually, no, I'll leave that one there if anybody has any comments on that. Mandy, I'll, I'll have, a, have a go at that one. So it looks like um, reading through your questions, and you may well be growing spinach. It's every likelihood in Pearsdale that what, what you have is Liriomyza kinopodi, which is fairly, you know, another Liriomyza, which is um, ironically an Australian species, a native, we believe, but, we've, but it, it does attack a range of, uh, range, of, range of plants, usually in the kinopodi. But, um, it's, it has a very similar situation to all these Liriomyzas, where nearly all of these ones will, will um, Leave, leave, leave the leaf. They won't pupate inside the leaf, unlike a, a south thistle leaf miner. You have a question also about ceromazin. Um, ceromazin is, isn't a registered insecticide for leaf miners in Australia, but it, we do have an emergency use permit uh, for use against either Liriomyza sativi, Liriomyza huidabrensis, Liriomyza trifoli in, in, in some crops. Um, and so it's not available for general use. Um, the New South Wales Department have an extensive list on their website of um, the current status of chemical permits that are available. But and so that will be passed out again. I think in the that Maddie will probably do that in the email. But I stress that these are emergency use permits for people that actually have have those particular pests. Right. Thank uh, I'd you, also Peter. Say, I'd also, also say that, that I'd be happy to engage further with you, you know, after the webinar, you know, by email or, or telephone call. So I'd be interested to have a talk when we can actually go out and visit people. <laughs> Might be some time. That would be great. Well, for that, um, the person that sent through that question, if you'd just like to email science at ausveg.com.au, um, we can get you in touch with Peter there. So thank you. We have another question that's come through. According to the description, Liriomyces weedabrensis pupates in soil. I have sampled spinach leaves with mines and all pupa are, um, are stuck on the glass. 100% of maggots pupate outside. Is this Liriomyces weedabrensis? Well, again, it's a, it's it's still likely to be uh, they have they have the similar situation where they'll be leaving cutting cutting their way out of the out of the plant uh, and and not not a move, not pupating within the leaf. So, my, Murphy's law would say the the most simple explanation is that it's likely to be a liriomyces that we already have in, it, in the country, but never say never. And that's why it's always important that we want to have samples such as this so we can test them. We can test them very rapidly. And uh, that would be a good, a good thing to do to, uh, to have them tested. And, and, and I guess we can follow that one up. Uh, this particular leaf miner tends to be a problem October, November, December. That's when it's, you see it commonly. Thanks, Peter. Um, so just a little bit of a different question here. Are there parasitoid wasps available to buy in Australia? I've asked a few suppliers and have not been able to get any. Thanks. 
I can answer that as well. <laughs> yes, we, there are no, <laughs> there, are, there are no uh, suppliers at the moment. Um, it's, it's, it's quite an expensive business to rear these particular wasps. Um, when you have the deglyphus, it's used extensively in, in glass houses in, in Europe and USA. And that's often in cases where they're using biocontrol agents to control other things in the, in the glass house. So they use controlling thrips, they're controlling two spotted mite. And if you start spraying too much insecticide, you're likely to disrupt the whole system. So what, they have, what you do normally with the deglyphus, you actually have to make three releases a week apart early in the season. So that, and because you actually have to release live wasps, it's, they are relatively quite expensive. But, you know, bugs for bugs are interested in developing the capability and, and know that some of the other producers are as well. Uh, it's a question of uh, what I'd really like to say is that it's, it's aimed more at glass houses than, than outside, outside crops. But it's sort of supply and demand thing, but I, I would be very surprised if in the in the next few years that that we don't start producing bugs and bugs. I know we'll be keen, and other producers will be keen to start exploring the the, the option. It's it's a proven technology. I'm afraid you just have to wait for a while till they start producing commercial quantities. Fantastic. Thanks again, Peter. It looks like parasitoid wasps is a really um, interesting part of today's webinar. So there's another question on that note. What resources do you recommend to find out what we know to provide um, supportive environments near crops for parasitoid wasps? I think that's my question as well. <laughs> uh, look, that's the big question is, look, we don't really know, but Inevitably, we do, what we do know is that we, the common weeds in roadsides, around fences, brassicaceous weeds, uh, sow thistles, all these sorts of things have a pretty active uh, leaf miners at different times and they have a range of parasitoids. The other one that's important is plant, plantago, plantain. Um, and so all of those ones are, uh, are, are important. To go to the next stage of, of potentially, I guess, having specialised areas to breeding parasitoids, that's, we don't, you know, we'll need to not learn what's going on there. But there may well be situations too in some crops which where they, where they, that aren't being sprayed very intensively may well become uh, reservoirs for parasitoids. I think in some, something like a pumpkin crop in, in Bowen and Bundaberg, they may well become a reservoir for parasitoids for more heavily sprayed crops that are grown nearby. So, that's, that's all we can really say. But what is amazing is that these incredibly small wasps are all over the place. They're just so small, no one's really found them before. So, you know, it's, it's extreme. It's ex I'm extremely confident that they're out there, out and about. Uh, but how we can promote them, that's, that'll be it. You know, that, that's where our experiences will, will come over. Absolutely. Couldn't agree more. Um, could Ausveg supply a list that rates the soft chemicals that have a permit for American serpentine leaf miner and serpentine leaf miner for their toxicity to parasitoids? Um, that definitely is a possibility that Ausveg can work on, potentially with Hort Innovation as well. We might look at working together on something like that um, and then, you know, communicating that through our Ausveg weekly update and through Hort Innovation's channels as well. I will say, um, and someone like someone like Andy Ryland, who's uh, involved in production of natural enemies, is um, he'll be listening with interest, and I'm sure he's contemplating the situation as well. All right, moving on to the next question: um, What testing do you employ for identification of Liriomyza species? Who'd like to have a go at this one? I'll have a go if you like. Sure. <laughs> is it, is what we the traditional way the leaf miners look very similar. So to be conclusive, we've had to rely in the past on dissecting male flies and looking at the genitalia. And that's how, in fact, that's the definitive way of looking at it. They have very distinctive genitalia. That's very tricky because if you've got a female fly, you can't tell. If you've got larvae, you can't tell. So there's been a lot of work done and it's well established now of looking at molecular methods for rapid testing of, of the species. And so 
that's that's well established. It was part of the, the first project. The second project's taking that to us to another level again. We're looking at lab tests, we're looking at uh, other fancy tests for, for rapid diagnosis. So that's the definitive sort of situation. I guess once you've got the pest, you'll get A, you'll get to know it, and B, you probably won't need to identify it because you'll have a situation a bit like Penny's got where you've got uh, lettuce crops falling over, you've got bean crops falling over as well. But, but the critical thing at the moment, we've got large parts of the country where we don't have the leaf miners. And it's important that we, that we keep testing. So if people have got suspect leaf miners, it's really important that we test them so that we, it's better to have a negative result than just assume it's, it's not a, not a, not a trifoliate, it's not a quidabrensis. It's far too easy to sort of think, oh, well, you see a sow thistle, which is commonly infested with leaf miners, and you need now to look to see that it actually is, the, 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 whether it is one of these nasty ones, because like all these things, the sooner you pick it up, the better it is for managing it. If we leave, wait till the entire state, say Victoria is covered in leaf miners, and we say, oh, we thought it was something else, we'd look pretty silly. So it's really important to keep testing. And that's the advantage of these rapid tests that they can be done so quickly. Yeah, Maddie, I can, I can probably kick on a little bit with some of the more rapid molecular tests. So the, the, the previous project and the current project have developed quantitative PCR tests for the three species. So the idea there is you can get an answer within a couple of hours once the, the lab receives it. So that's, um, there has been some work done overseas on some LAMP tests, but they had not been tested in Australia and they were found a bit wanting when they were used. Uh, I believe in the Huida Brensis uh, invasion. And the other thing that the, um, the first project did, and we're continuing that with the second, is using the, the leftover DNA in the leaf mines. So we'll call that environmental DNA. So if you've got an empty leaf mine, there's still a potential to work out what that thing is by getting the traces of DNA that's left in it. So even if there's nothing left in that mine, collect up a few leaves to submit for your sample, and there's still a good chance we can get something out of it. Fantastic. Thank you, Greg. So just a few more comments, and then I've got a couple of more questions to ask. Um, just a comment saying bugs for bugs are looking at a suitable lo uh, locally grown parasitoid to try and rear. And Jessica Page recently finished a project looking at pesticides effect on BCAs, a synthetic of that work, uh, synthesis of that work, RE parasitoids would be useful. So thanks for those comments. Um, I'd just like to direct the question to Penny. What has been your experience working with some of the growers and what, you know, what are their kind of thoughts on this situation currently in Pananara and how, how do they feel about the situation that's going on and the detections? Um, I guess everyone's sort of watching very closely to see what it's going to do in their crops. Um, and, yeah, I'm sort of getting lots of photos coming through. Is this a leaf miner? Is that a leaf miner? Um, the Department um, of Primary Industries and Regional Development here are working on various projects um, in terms of detection and looking at um, surveying for parasitoids and those sorts of things as well. Um, but, yeah, the growers are just... Uh, I guess they're concerned um, and wanting to know what the treatment options can be, um, minor use permits and those sorts of things. At this stage, it's been one grower, unfortunately one grower who's been singled out. Um, he grows a variety of everything, market garden style, um, all the lettuces, tomatoes and um, cut flowers and those sorts of things. He's been hit the hardest and the other crops haven't really apart from that one cucurbit crop, which was nearly ready to pick, I think, anyway, um, haven't been that badly affected. So I guess they're, they're watching it very closely, but at this stage, um, yeah, they're not super concerned. Thanks for that. And um, one last final question looking to ask of Robert. What would, you, what would be a message you would say to the Australian horticulture industry in terms of preparedness for American serpentine leaf miner and management? Are there any comments that you'd like to add just in terms of all the experience you've had overseas? I think uh, an important point is this uh, resistance. 
you see that you are get uh, prepared to, to get uh, more than one active ingredient available. So that may be with uh, lobbying. Normally, it's difficult because it's a, the target is small crops. So it's often it's not very interesting for 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 the the big companies like, like us as well. And therefore, it's it's important that the, the vegetable organization do some lobbying that they get more than one active ingredient available to be able to alternate together with beneficials. That will be my recommendation. Fantastic. And I think look, that's key to what we've been discussing today. So with that, I'd like to thank all of the speakers today for taking your time out of your day to present to, I, I believe, about 109 people on the line today. So thanks for your time and thank you to everybody for listening in. Um, as I mentioned, we'll be sending a follow-up email out to attendees in the next couple of days with the recording as well and a post-webinar survey. So please fill that in if you can, um, as it will really help tailor future events. Um, and we look forward to having you join us at the next webinar. So thank you again.